Hello there, Internet. Vinny D here, and I am coming to you with part three of What If Kal El Was Goku. When we last left off, we just finished up the Kryptonian saga. And what changed? Well, rather than Raditz mm. arriving to start things off, it's Superman's own cousin, Kara Zor-El. But a very different Kara from the comics. She's led a harsh life as a warrior working for the evil Emperor Frieza. But the fierce battle between Piccolo, Goku, and Kara leaves Kara injured, but still alive. And that pays off in the big finale when she returns to help out against the evil Zod. Unfortunately, the fatalities are much the same. The fallen include Tien Shenhan, Chaozu, and Yamcha, along with Piccolo. Meaning, Kami goes too, and there are no Dragon Balls left on Earth. From here, things go much the same way they did in Dragon Ball Z, with the help of Mr. Popo. Fulfilling Kami's final wishes, they gain Kami's ship, and off go Krillin, Gohan, and Bulma. There's of course a slight change in this timeline, Gohan's mother is Bulma. So, this is a chance for Gohan to reconnect with the family he hasn't seen in a year. And honestly, at this point, a little boy really needs his mom. Given Bulma is freaking brilliant, and Gohan seems to be following in her footsteps with being extremely intelligent too, he doesn't have a big pile of homework, but Bulma is going to help tutor him, while Krillin helps Gohan to train. And off they go. Fake Namek? is completely irrelevant whether it even happens or not. Goku recovers enough to leave the hospital on his own because of that super fast Kryptonian healing. So he actually recovers about a day early. However, this doesn't really grant him a head start because unlike Kakarot Goku, Kal-El Goku is a bit more responsible and he thinks, if I leave, the Earth is completely unguarded. So he runs around the Earth and gathers up the C-Team. The C-Team consists of Chi-Chi, who as you may remember, having not married Goku, never settled down and instead continued her martial arts training, becoming quite a bit stronger. And while she more considers herself an adventurer than a hero, she gladly heeds the call. Next up is Master Roshi, because he may not have kept up with the insane levels of power that have happened as of late, he's still an incredibly good martial artist. And the toughest to convince, of course, is Yachirobe. Yachirobe is strong, but stubborn and incredibly lazy. For adventure, excitement, Yachirobe does not care for these things. So, ultimately, Kal-El just agrees to pay him. Yajirobe isn't too interested in money either, but after a little explaining that money can be exchanged for goods and services, including food, Yajirobe agrees to step up if any danger happens while the rest of the heroes are away. With that in order, Dr. Briefs also agrees to provide any scientific consulting the team may need, and Goku also plans to depart. But just before he leaves, someone else asks to come as well. Kara gave it a lot of careful consideration. She thought at once maybe she should just leave everything alone, make her new home here on Earth, enjoy a peaceful life. She never liked being a warrior. She wanted to be a scientist when she was growing up. The harsh reality of her life did not allow her that. But she also feels guilty for starting this whole thing. And with a little bit of encouragement from her friend Chi-Chi, Kara does decide to go with Goku. Goku, however, says there's one thing 
she has to do in order to get on this ship. Tell me about Krypton. With a heartfelt smile and a nod, Kara boards, and the two Kryptonians depart for space. They find Dr. Briefs has built this ship well. Not only did he include a gravity generator for high gravity training, he also included yellow sun lamps. Kara had helped out on this project as well, providing data about the primordial climate of Krypton when its sun was still yellow and its environment harsh and unforgiving. This was the environment under which Kryptonians evolved their incredible powers, and it could be replicated inside the ship. Training and talking would fill the days for these two Kryptonians until they made their arrival on Namek. Zod has crawled back in defeat and utilizes a healing chamber to recover from his injuries. Zod does pretty much the same thing Vegeta did, goes rogue and departs for Namek. But this time, Zod's motivations are just a little bit different. Before, he was motivated by the restoration of Krypton, but knowing that's impossible, he has something else in mind. Revenge. Revenge against the one who ruined his life because Zod never believed that Krypton just exploded on its own. No, he long held his suspicions that Frieza was the one who did the deed. After all, he remembers he was Frieza's hostage against his own father, the original Zod, when Krypton was destroyed. Zod thinks of how he should have been a great military leader, and instead, is left as Frieza's bootlicking lackey. The time had at last come to take his vengeance. He thought now surely he could just wish for Frieza to drop dead, for his head to explode, for him to have a heart attack or some horrible illness, but no, Zod wants to do this with his own two hands. To see the life drain from Frieza's eyes himself. And the only way he's going to do that, with as insanely powerful as Frieza is, is to be completely indestructible. He plans now to wish for immortality. Kui follows Zod, and when they meet up on Namek, there's one difference. Kryptonians don't get power boosts after a big defeat. But Zod has already observed something coming in on the planet. There are three suns. His power will grow at triple its normal rate. And here, I'm going to take a moment to throw something extra in. Kryptonians don't get Zenkai boosts. However, there is something else DC Comics tends to give them. Something we'll call power creep. Because once a Kryptonian achieves a feat of strength, it just becomes part of their ordinary base. The first time Superman moved the moon in the comics, it was a great effort. Soon enough, he's towing multiple planets. But still, Zod is more careful when he meets Kui on Namek. And he decides to use a little bit of tactical thinking. Think about it, Kui. With the power of these Dragon Balls, why would we ever have to bow to Frieza again? Kui thinks it over. It's a tempting prospect. And for a brief time, Kui actually does consider working with Zod. And they actually go searching together for the Dragon Balls. Until the rest of Frieza's force has followed them there. Frieza showing up makes Kui lose his nerves. He thinks he'll go crawling back to Frieza and turn in the traitorous Zod, make himself look at like a hero. But Zod's already increased his power. The moment Kui's back is turned, Zod takes him out. 
How are Krillin and Gohan doing since landing on Namek? About the same as in Dragon Ball Z. Things, though, change at one critical moment. The same time they rescued Dende. Yes, Gohan still rushes in. Dende still gets rescued. But, Gohan's also been absorbing triple sun energy. This Gohan is now much, much stronger than the Gohan of Dragon Ball Z. So that big surprise hit on Dodoria doesn't just knock Dodoria out. It takes his head off. Literally. Decapitation! Head goes flying. It's really gross. Dodoria is dead. In fact, the sudden surprise gives Krillin and Gohan a moment. But Gohan's in the middle of a rage burst. And now he's looking at Frieza, like he could actually do something about it. Fortunately, Krillin proves the voice of reason as he grabs Dende and yells, Gohan, run! Gohan snaps too and they pack it out of there. Zarbon's so flabbergasted he doesn't react very quickly, and they gain a slightly longer lead than they had originally. Until Frieza tells Zarbon, Zarbon, you don't go after them! R right away, Lord Frieza! So Krillin and Gohan need that head start, because Zarbon is much faster than Dodoria. And this means when Vegeta ran into Dodoria, this isn't happening, because Dodoria is in two pieces on the ground now, and instead, Zod has a run-in with Zarbon. Zod isn't ready for Zarbon just yet. But when Zarbon catches sight of the traitorous Zod, he goes after him instead, allowing Krillin and Gohan to escape while Zod pulls a tactical retreat. So, back at the cave. Gohan's now a bit shaken up. He's had a few rage bursts before, but nothing like this. He's never killed anyone before. And right now, he really needs to see his mom. Bulma assures her son that the man he killed was bad, and it was an accident. So that doesn't make him a bad person. Gohan cries it out, and eventually he recovers. And they have time to introduce Dende between the three of them. With the help of Dende, they return to their search. Zod, meanwhile, is having a hell of a time trying to shake Zarbon. Zod decides he's going to have to pull his little sun-dipping trick and heads upward. But Zarbon knows about this trick. Zod isn't able to get high enough in time. Zarbon transforms for a boost of speed, gets ahead of Zod, and whacks him back to the ground. Zarbon is now completely blitzing Zod, putting a beating on him. And he's ready to finish the job, but Zod chokes out. You'll never fight the Dragon Balls without me. Zarbon transforms back. Zod explains that he's hidden some Dragon Balls. They'll never find them without the information that Zod has. So we can forget the whole throwing Vegeta in a lake like in Dragon Ball Z. No. Zod just gets taken prisoner immediately and thrown into a healing pod. But... Zod wasn't unconscious. He was faking. As soon as he's left alone, he breaks out. Before anyone knows what's happening, Zod has snatched up the Dragon Balls Frieza had on the ship and is on his way. Zarbon is in hot pursuit. The high-speed rematch doesn't go Zarbon's way. Zarbon may be stronger, but Zod's learned from their previous encounter. He's using ranged attacks, key blasts, heat vision. He's keeping Zarbon from catching up with him. He just needs to get a little bit higher. Just out of the atmosphere, out of Zarbon's reach. And when Zod is where Zarbon can't follow, he estimated. He doesn't even need to do a sun dip for this. 
he can take out Zarbon more quickly before he reports back. All he needs is just a few seconds in the far upper atmosphere, in the light of three suns unobstructed by planetary atmosphere. Zarbon estimates that he has a few minutes. He estimates wrong. And with this power boost, Zod puts an end to Zarbon. This is where things start to change more drastically. Frieza has no more threatening soldiers on Namek at this time. This grants Krillin and Gohan a bit of a respite. They only have to avoid Zod. They actually manage to obtain one extra Dragon Ball and prevent a Namekian village from being destroyed by getting the Dragon Ball first. And Dende goes ahead and takes them to see Guru, this time at the same time. Sure, Krillin gets a bit of a power boost, but Gohan? Even Guru didn't expect this to happen. Guru unlocking Gohan's potential? meant unlocking his full Kryptonian power set, something that took Goku years to come into naturally. Gohan is overwhelmed by the expansion of his senses. His hearing is increased, he can hear all over the planet, in fact. His vision is improved, he's seeing whole spectrums his eyes couldn't perceive before. He can see through walls. Oh, and also now he can fly without even using key. I guess that's mildly convenient. And of course there's the power. The sheer overwhelming power that's being released. It's a lot for Gohan to take in. At last, the Superboy has awakened. Krillin takes Gohan back to Bulma, hoping she would understand what's going on. Since she married a Kryptonian, she might know a bit more about them. Bulma sighs. She really wished his father would have been here for this. But she explains it as well as she knows from her experiences with Goku. But things are looking up. Gohan's much stronger. Frieza's down some of his best men. And they're making progress finding the Dragon Balls. But now Frieza's calling in his best. This explosion in power, however, has gotten Zod's attention, because he's learned to sense power levels as well. And he follows them back to their cave. Krillin and Gohan are expecting a battle, but Zod comes to them and says, Look, I don't like you, and you don't like me, but if we don't work together, you, me, the woman, and everything on this planet is dead. Zod's a Kryptonian, too, after all, and he can also hear everything on the planet. And he can sort it out a lot better. And what he hears is Frieza chewing out what's left of his men. And he was able to hear Frieza say, Call the Ginyu Force. And that's where we're going to leave it for now. The Ginyu Force is arriving early and Goku will not arrive in time to fight them. So what will happen to our heroes on Namek? Will they be crushed, as were the heroes against the Ginyu Force in Dragon Ball Z? Or will the rise of the Superboy make a difference? Come back next time for part four of What If Kal-El Was Goku. <laughs>